Exploring the majestic beauty of nature's wilderness can be one of the most exciting and fulfilling experiences of your life. Scaling a snow-capped mountain peak. Forging deep into a lush green forest with trees that almost touch the sky. Discovering a hidden valley, abandoned mine or game trail. Splashing in an invigorating mountain spring. Or relaxing next to a quiet, pristine lake. But there's more to backpacking than throwing a pack on your back and heading out into the wilderness. And that's what Backpacking Made Easy is all about. A little while from now, you'll know all the essentials for having a great time in the wild. We'll show you the latest in backpacks, boots, tents, sleeping bags, and other wilderness equipment. We'll show you how to pack your backpack and how to set up camp. You'll discover how to get where you're going without getting lost and how to get back safely. Most important, you'll learn how to leave the wild as pristine as you found it. Two thoughts before we start. First, we suggest you watch the video all the way through first time. We put in lots of titles to make it easy to find what you're looking for later. Second, we hope that this video introduces you to the joys of the outdoors, but be aware that people put pressure on our fragile environment. Please use your new outdoor skills with care and caring. Now, let's get started. The single most important piece of equipment you'll take on your trip is sitting right on your shoulders, your head. Take the time to think through and thoroughly plan your trip. Here are a few important things to consider. First, you should never go backpacking alone. Groups of three or more are recommended. Next, don't overdo it. This isn't the contest. The wilderness is no place for macho bravado. Backpacking should be fun. Remember, the slowest person in the group is working just as hard as you. So set reasonable goals, particularly on your first excursion. It's important to determine everyone's ability level and stay within it. Even though you plan to live in the wild for a while, you can't escape civilization completely. That means rules and regulations. State and national parks may require camping permits. Some areas of the country have waiting lists. So be sure to apply for your permits well in advance. You might try going during the week to avoid large weekend crowds. And always get permission to enter private property unless you're on an established trail with an easement or right of way. Don't forget about hunting and fishing licenses. It's also wise to carry a personal ID, like your driver's license. Park rangers may ask for one. Keep an eye on the weather, too. The kind of clothes you wear and the gear you bring along will depend greatly on what Mother Nature has in store for you. Be prepared for changes in weather. Talk to a local ranger or hiking club. They can tell you what to expect. Before you strike out to blaze new trails in the wild, get in shape. A fully loaded backpack can be as much as 20 to 25 percent of your body weight. Jogging or even simple walking can toughen up your legs. Take your backpack along. You'll need to get accustomed to carrying an extra 25 to 40 pounds. An essential item to any backpacker is a topographic map of the area. A topographic map is an aerial view of the Earth's surface. Notice that all the distinguishing features like rivers, mountains, buildings and forests are represented by four main colors. Black, green, blue and brown. Take the time to learn topographic map symbols. They'll help you keep from getting lost in unfamiliar wilderness. Practice by taking a topographic map to a high point of land with good visibility. Look out over the landscape and see if you can pick out a variety of landmarks marked on your map. Once you learn to relate the symbols on the map to what's around you in the wild, you'll always have a good idea of where you are. In addition, most established trails have guidebooks available. Many camping stores carry the guidebooks and maps you will need, so check with them first. If you can't find the maps you need at your local outdoor camping store, you can order them. 
To order topographic maps for areas countrywide, write to U.S. Geological Survey, Distribution Center, Box 25286, Denver Federal Center, Denver, Colorado, 80225. Today's modern compass is designed to work easily with a topographic map. It consists of three main parts. A magnetic needle that points north, a revolving compass housing for determining your bearing, and a transparent base with a direction of travel arrow. With a topographic map and compass, finding your destination is easy. The three-step procedure is foolproof. Step one, place the compass on the map and connect your starting point with your destination by using the edge of the transparent base plate. We'll start here and end here. It is essential that you locate your starting point before you start hiking. Step two, without moving the base plate, turn the compass dial until the red orienting arrow points to magnetic north on the map. Be sure and adjust for magnetic declination. Step three, hold the compass level in front of you with the direction of travel arrow pointing straight ahead. Turn your entire body until the red magnetic needle lies directly over the red arrow in the base of the compass. The direction of travel arrow now points directly to your destination. Look up and start walking. If you can't see your destination, walk to it in stages. Pick out a distant landmark that's on your course and walk to it. Look for things like distant ridges or large trees. The landmark should be distinctive enough that you'll recognize it from all angles. Take time to study it. A minute spent now could save half an hour of backtracking. Once you reach that landmark, orient the compass by turning your body so that the magnetic north needle and the red arrow align. Now follow the direction of travel arrow to another distant landmark. Just keep walking from landmark to landmark until you reach your destination. This is called leapfrogging. To return home, simply point the direction of travel arrow toward you, align the needle and arrow by turning your body, then walk straight ahead. The bearing will be 180 degrees from your initial bearing. Two good ideas. First, make sure you know your starting point. Find it on the map and orient yourself to it. Second, Remember to look backwards every once in a while. You'll get some great views that way, and you'll see what things are going to look like when on your trip home. Today's backpacking boots come in a variety of materials, from traditional leather to synthetic fabrics. But regardless of style, what you're looking for is fit, fit, and more fit. A sore pair of feet can make a long day even longer. Your boots should feel good on your feet, allowing freedom of movement and balance. Check for foot and ankle support, side-to-side -side stability, rocker stiffness, arch support, and front-to-rear stability. You have over 26 functional bones in your foot, and they all need lots of support. So take your time finding a boot that feels good on your foot. Break your boots in thoroughly before you backpack in them. Boots are the most important piece of gear you'll buy. Go for short walks in them until they're comfortable and well broken in. Regardless of type or style, you may have to waterproof your boot uppers and welt seams. Check with your store for details. However, boots are only part of the total footgear picture. When you buy a pair of boots, try them on with the kind of socks you'll be wearing. Be sure and wear two pair of socks, a thin inner pair and a thick outer pair. As you walk, the socks rub against each other, reducing friction and blistering. Wear a thin, lightweight inner sock of light wool, silk, polypropylene, or blends of these. Thick wool works best for the outer pair. Wool moves sweat upward along its fibers and out of the boot where it evaporates. Even if you get wool soaking wet, it still retains heat, and it won't bunch up, which causes blisters. Nylon gaiters are a good idea, too. They help keep rain, pebbles, and other debris out of your boots and socks. 
Bring along some mold skin, too, just in case your feet do blister. Use the mold skin before your blister gets too far along. When you start to feel a hot spot, then cut the mold skin to shape and place it over the potential blister. If the blister is too far advanced, cut the mold skin so it can be placed around the outside of the blister. This adds cushioning, but doesn't irritate the blister. Give your feet a break. Bring along a pair of sneakers or moccasins for a change of pace around the camp. What you wear backpacking is pretty much a matter of weather and personal preference. But a few guidelines might come in handy. Dress in layers. It's the best way to control your body's thermal equilibrium. As your body temperature changes, you simply add or subtract layers. The secret is to let chilling perspiration out while keeping damp weather from getting in. That way, you're never too hot or too cold, but just right. In cold weather, a three-layer system works best. Start with long underwear. Synthetics, such as polypropylene, have become the fabrics of choice. They move moisture away from your skin. Since the fibers absorb virtually no moisture, your perspiration passes right through the fabric and evaporates. Cotton thermal underwear should be avoided. It is useless when wet. For the second layer, wool shirts or sweaters have been the garment of choice for years. Wool breathes well and keeps you warm when wet. Synthetic pile garments will also keep you warm when wet and dry out faster than wool. Again, cotton does not insulate when wet and should be left behind. Since your pants are more likely to get wet, lightweight wool or pile are best. It's also a good idea to bring two pairs of pants along on the trip, one for hiking and one for the campsite. Bring along a pair of shorts, too, for when the weather turns warm. The third layer is determined by Mother Nature. If it's nice out, a simple nylon windbreaker works fine. In cold weather, wear a down or synthetic-filled vest for added warmth. If the weather turns wet and cold, you'll need to put on a water-repellent outer layer. A poncho is the cheapest way to keep dry, but rain suits with hoods are more effective, especially in strong winds. Some rain gear breathes and blocks out moisture. It's more expensive, but is worth investigating. Remember to get rain gear larger than your usual size. You'll be wearing it over heavier clothing. Bring a hat along, too. It'll shade you from the sun, protect you from the rain, and prevents heat loss from your head. A backpack is like a good shoe. You look for quality and a perfect fit. All backpacks are either panel loaders or top loaders. Panel loaders give you instant access to everything in your pack. Top loaders usually hold more and are more weatherproof. There are essentially three types of backpacks. Small day packs, external frame packs, and internal frame packs. Day packs are just that, packs you use for a few hour hike. They work great for carrying a day's worth of essentials like food, water, camera, and extra clothing. Plan what you do and carry enough for emergencies. And be sure to remember your rain gear. If you plan to stay in the wild for a few days, then you'll need a full-size external or internal frame pack. The key is comfort, and that means fit. The key to fit is adjustability. A good pack should adjust fairly easily and quickly. It should have enough adjustments to fit you properly. Well-designed packs come in different sizes, too, because people come in different sizes. Make sure you get your backpack to fit in the store and learn how to make the necessary adjustments there. If it is not adjusted properly, your ability to distribute weight will be impaired, and you'll tire much more quickly. If you plan to do most of your backpacking on developed trails and carry enough gear for several days, then the external frame backpack will probably suit you best. It places the load over your natural center of gravity to help you walk upright. The frame has an S-curve, which matches the shape of your back. The pack directs weight to the hip belt, which in turn distributes the weight evenly around your waist and hips. A good external frame has solid heliarch welds at the joints. 
external frame systems let you carry lots of stuff. Internal frame packs fit closer to your back, so they're easier to control than an external frame. They work great for rock climbing, ski touring, snowshoeing, and canoeing. Notice there are no exposed frame parts to catch on rocks and branches. Aluminum stays can be bent to fit the contour of your back. Adjustable compression, stabilizing, and sternum straps help keep the load snug to your body, even when you bend over. Keeping these straps tight helps you control the load in rugged terrain. Which one you choose is really a matter of personal preference. Try them on and see which style fits you best. You may even want to rent or borrow a backpack for your first couple of trips to get a feel for what pack works best for you. Regardless of what you choose, look for quality. A good pack will feel good on you. Look for comfort features like conical cut hip belts. They fit your pelvis better. Tapered shoulder straps minimize chafing. Extra padding on the shoulder straps and hip belt make the pack more comfortable. Sternum straps keep shoulder straps from moving. Look for at least seven stitches per inch, extra layers of fabric at stress points, and numerous pockets and dividers. And packs with coated nylon storm hoods help keep them waterproof. Make sure the pack fits nice and snug. A good fitting pack should move with the rhythm of your body. While trying on backpacks, be sure and stuff the bag with something that approximates 20 to 25 percent of your body weight. This is the weight you can comfortably carry. It's possible to carry more, but that's a beginner's mistake. Many stores have sandbags available for just this purpose. Before you even start to pack your backpack, do yourself a favor and get plenty of little stuff sacks. They help keep things organized and easy to get at. Try and keep the heaviest gear high in the pack, close to your back and over your center of gravity. Medium weight things store in the middle of the pack, and lightweight items fill spaces at the bottom of the pack, farthest away from your center of gravity. Also, share the heavy items among members of the group. A well-organized pack might look something like this. Heavy items at A, medium weight items at B, and your lightest things at C. Keep your cooking stove and fuel in a side pocket in case of spills. And lash long objects to the side of the pack, or use the handy tunnel pockets. One final hint. Your backpack makes a great back rest. Lean it against a tree or rock and relax. How do you choose the tent that's right for you? Simple. Crawl in and see how it feels. Do you have enough floor space? Is there enough headroom? Can you put it up easily? With a few variations, backpacking tents tend to come in three basic shapes. A-frame, tunnel or hoop, and dome or geodesic domes. A-frame is the classic shape. They're easy to set up and fairly roomy. Tunnel or hoop shapes emphasize lightweight and compact package size. They're usually not as stable because they are not freestanding. Dome tents are very roomy, maximizing internal volume in relation to floor space. All three shapes share common design features. They start with lightweight aluminum or fiberglass frames. The tent is made of lightweight nylon fabric. And while the lower walls and floor are waterproofed, the roof is not. This allows moisture produced by sleeping campers to escape without forming condensation. A second roof or rain fly is then stretched over the tent to keep out the rain. The open space between the tent and the fly permits the tent to breathe. Good tents have strong zippers, strong shot corded poles, clothesline rings, convenient and visible storage pouches, waterproof coated floors, protective window overhangs, and lots of cross ventilation through the use of windows and vents. A good tent should be easy to set up and sturdy in bad weather. 
Choose the design and size that best fits your needs for space. However, keep in mind that the larger the tent, the more it weighs. And an extra two pounds means a lot when it's on your back. No matter which tent you choose, practice putting it up before you head out into the wilderness. And while you've got it up, take time to seal the seams with seam sealer. If you don't, the needle holes from the stitching may allow water to seep in. Good quality tents come with sealers. Bring along a nylon tarp, too. They shade you from the sun and allow you to cook even in a downpour. A couple of desirable add-ons for tents are vestibules and gear lofts. Once again, you have a choice to make. Sleeping bags come in variations of two basic designs, mummy and square cut. Mummy style bags wrap you head to toe, leaving only your face exposed. Obviously, this type of bag provides maximum warmth. However, some people find them too confining. Square cut designs offer more room to move around in, but they leave your head and shoulders exposed. In warm weather, that means very little. In cold weather, that means a lot. You also have a choice of down-filled or synthetic-filled. Down is lighter and warmer per ounce than synthetic materials. So down-filled sleeping bags weigh a lot less. They also compress into a much smaller, easier to carry roll. However, down bags are much more expensive. They won't hold heat when wet and can cause allergies in some people. Down also takes longer to dry. Synthetic filled bags retain their loft and warmth when wet and are mildew resistant. Regardless of which bag you choose, remember to air them out each morning on the trail to eliminate moisture buildup. Because your body compresses your sleeping bag, be sure and bring along a sleeping pad. Closed cell foam pads and a layer of cushion insulate you from the ground and don't absorb water. One step up in luxury and price, and you'll find the self-inflating mattress. It's a mattress of open cell foam covered by an airtight waterproof nylon shell. Pads and mattresses come in a variety of sizes, from comfortable full body to shorter and lighter torso lengths. There are other insulating systems as well. Here are some helpful hints on how to sleep warm. Remember, it's harder to regain heat than to retain heat. So maintain a proper fluid balance. Dehydration chills the body. Don't eat a heavy meal right before bedtime. Digestion draws blood away from the extremities. Keep dry. Don't hang around the camp in wet clothing. Wear dry underwear or nothing at all in your sleeping bag. Body moisture can accumulate in underwear and cause a chill. And contrary to popular opinion, alcohol only lowers body temperature. Did you know you can walk a lot farther if you walk with a constant, steady, unbroken rhythm? Set an easy pace. Roughly speaking, the energy expended in walking doubles with each mile per hour increase of speed. In addition, a faster pace increases lactic acid buildup in the leg muscles and makes them stiff. Stand erect and shorten your stride. It helps keep your pack balanced over your center of gravity. Today's backpacks do a good job of distributing the weight evenly around your hips. Bending forward throws the pack off balance and puts excessive pressure on your back. By the end of the day, your back will be needlessly stiff and sore. If you start to slump, carry a walking stick. It'll give you added stability. When walking up hills, shorten your stride even more. It'll help keep your feet under you for better balance. And put your hands on your hips for added support. If you want to know how far you've walked, count your double steps. By that, we mean counting each time you put your left or right foot down. One, two, three, four, five. For the average person, one double step is roughly five feet. 1,000 double steps is roughly a mile. However, in the wild, how far you walk is less important than the time it'll take. These times will vary depending on your pace, but they're a good place to start. 
figure on a little more than two miles per hour for flat terrain, a little less than two miles an hour for moderate terrain, and about one mile per hour in more severe terrain. Some very steep mountain terrain could reduce your time to less than a half mile per hour. Try timing yourself over a one mile course and use that time for gauging your own walking speed. Your timing should be adjusted for the load you carry and the terrain you cover. Remember, the air is much thinner in high altitudes, so your blood gets less oxygen with each breath. If you're not from that altitude, it's especially important to take it easy at first while your body acclimates. The secret, especially in altitudes over 10,000 feet, is to slow your pace to avoid overexertion. Take long, deep breaths to provide ample oxygen to your muscles, and drink plenty of water to prevent dehydration. What you eat, you'll carry in on your back. And the amount of food and water you carry depends on how many days you're out and how much you eat. Most people learn by trial and error. Keep these things in mind when choosing what to bring. Nutritional values, weight, ease of preparation. Be sure to include plenty of complex carbohydrates like rice and pasta. They burn fast and clean in your digestive system. Some backpackers like to carry in fresh food for the first couple of days, then rely upon dehydrated food later. Carrying dehydrated food is, of course, the lightest way to go. This includes naturally dried foods like raisins and pita bread from your supermarket. Most camping shops carry a wide variety of freeze-dried foods, from almond chicken to omelets to pizza. Many of them you can prepare and eat right out of the bag. So there are no pots or dishes to clean. Less than two and a quarter pounds of dehydrated food a day will satisfy your nutritional needs. But they are expensive, so you might want to check your grocer's shelf for alternatives like sausages, nuts, dried soup mixes, and dried food like peaches, apricots, and prunes. Dried fruits can add bulk to a freeze-dried diet. And non-refrigerated vacuum-sealed foods are less expensive and keep well in your pack. A variety of trail mixes are also available. And remember to bring along some snacks. Use nagoline bottles and resealable plastic bags for storing coffee, powdered milk, and spices. Be sure to label things so you'll know what's inside. And be sure to strip away as much of the food packaging as possible. It'll be less to carry on your way out. Never keep food in your tent. It can attract bears and a tent is no defense against a hungry bear. Keep the smell of food off your tent by cooking downwind and wash any spilled food from your clothing. At night, hang your food from a tree branch at least 10 feet high, far from the reach of bears or raccoons. The average person will drink about two quarts of water a day. In the desert, four quarts. Dehydration causes fatigue and disorientation so keep your fluid levels up. Frequent small drinks will do the job. Unfortunately, the days of drinking straight from even mountain streams are over. If you do drink from rivers and lakes, be sure to purify the water first. A nasty little protozoan called Giardia exists in most fresh waters these days. It's sure to make you sick. Boil the water for 10 minutes or chemically treat it by adding one tablet per quart of water and wait 10 minutes. Water purification filters are also available. To prolong the useful life of your filter, use a pre-filter to remove large particles. For carrying water, quart size, wide mouth, nagoline bottles work best. They're easy to pour and drink from. For the campsite, carry along a collapsible water bag. Cooking over an open fire is hazardous and prohibited in many areas. Portable one-burner camp stoves are much safer, convenient, and efficient. With a camp stove, there's no need to be close to firewood. Portable one-burner camp stoves come in two styles, white gasoline-fueled and butane cartridge-fueled. Butane stoves start easier, but burn less efficiently. White gas stoves generate more heat per ounce of fuel, saving weight and room in your pack. 
They cost more than butane models, but the gas is less expensive. Multifuel models that burn white and unleaded gas are also now available. Butane cartridge stoves are more convenient and cost less, but the cost of cartridges adds up. If you decide on a cartridge stove, be sure and carry out empty cartridges. That goes for any wrappers, bags, and cans that your food came in too. Bring plastic bags for storing waste materials. They'll help keep your backpack nice and clean. As for utensils, about all you really need is one cooking pot, one boiling pot, one cup and bowl per person, one spoon or fork per person, one cooking knife, one Swiss Army knife, salt and pepper shakers, one water bottle per person, and plenty of matches in a waterproof case. Plastic containers work well for milk, margarine, and other condiments. Camping stores offer a myriad of cooking gadgets. Give them a try. Here's a couple of interesting ones. Try a collapsible chair that fits in almost any backpack. It provides back support on flat ground and doubles as a sleeping pad. This heat exchanger is an interesting device too. You place it around your pot and then set them on your stove. The heat exchanger directs the heat around the pot for faster cooking. But remember, everything you use gets hauled around on your back. Today, the emphasis is on minimum impact. Following a few simple guidelines will make camping much more enjoyable for you and for the next camper who comes along. Use designated campsites whenever possible. If you can't, check local rules first. These rules exist to protect the environment and should always be respected. Here are some general guidelines. Choose a campsite at least 150 feet from water or marked trails. It will help safeguard the rivers and lakes from pollution and provide a more natural view for others passing by. High ground is preferable for drainage in case of rain. Pitch your tent on a flat spot if possible. Be sure and clear away loose rocks and twigs that might puncture your tent. If a flat spot is not available, make sure the door of your tent faces downhill so rainwater won't run in. A shady spot among a group of trees will prevent your tent from heating up. Avoid making camp under single trees on high ground in case of lightning. Avoid shallow caves where rattlesnakes and bears find their homes. Shallow caves can also attract lightning. If possible, face your tent into the warmth of the morning sun. To keep yourself from slipping out of your sleeping bag on slatting sites, sleep with your head uphill. Let's face it, when you're in the woods, you're roughing it. That's part of the fun. So in the absence of hot and cold running water, bring along some biodegradable soap. It works fine in cold water. A toothbrush and paste, a towel, and a roll of toilet paper. Remove the cardboard center. It'll take up less room in your pack. To dispose of human waste, cover it in a hole two to four inches deep at least 200 feet from the campsite and water. Bacteria in the ground will do the rest. Burn used toilet paper or place it in a plastic bag and carry it out with you. Here's a list of things you should consider bringing along. Your list will vary depending on the kind of trip you take, but these items will give you a good idea of the kind of things to consider. A medical kit, insect repellent, suntan lotion, lip balm, camera, whistle, sponge or chamois, knife, spare glasses or contacts, sunglasses, candle lantern, which gives the most light per ounce, flashlight or headlamp for hands-free work, gloves for cooking, binoculars, hot water pot or teapot, waterproof matches, emergency fishing tackle, and extra rope or nylon cord. In the wild, it's important to know where you are at all times. That's where your compass and map come in handy. Before starting out, be sure to determine your exact position on the map. 
Know how far you're going and how long it will take. Be sure and sign the register at the trailhead if you're hiking on a marked trail. Then sign out when you leave. Also, let someone know where you're going and when to expect you back. Leave them a detailed description of your planned route. Give them strict instructions to notify the park forest rangers if you're overdue. Allow extra time because it almost always takes longer than you think. Use your compass and follow the bearing from landmark to landmark until you reach your destination. Take time on the way in to look behind you occasionally. It'll look more familiar on your way out. If you can't find your destination, don't panic. It doesn't mean you're lost. Stop for a moment and take inventory of the situation. Double check your compass bearing and make sure you're on the right course. If it's correct, your destination is probably still ahead. If you're still confused, use your map. Try to identify prominent landmarks. Look for things like railroads, rivers, fences, or lake shores that you can follow. If you're on a marked trail, just waiting for someone to come along may be the answer. If all else fails, set up camp and wait for help. You should carry a spare compass, but if you lose your compass and map, let Mother Nature guide you. Use some old scout tricks. Check the wind direction. What direction was it blowing when you started? Chances are it's still the same. Some areas have prevailing winds that always let you know your direction. Even if there is no wind, in some areas the prevailing winds are so constant that trees are shaped with the short branches toward the wind. Use the obvious. Watch the sun. Remember, it rises in the east and sets in the west. And if it's night, try and find the North Star. Locate the two pointers. They are the stars at the forward edge of the dipper. Five and one-half times the distance between them in a straight line up from the dipper will be the North Star. The dipper rotates about it. Upon arriving home, make sure you unload your pack. Clothing, tents, and sleeping bags can mildew if left overnight without being aired and dried. It's best to let your sleeping bag air dry for 24 hours and occasionally fluff it by hand. Don't store it inside the stuff sack for long periods of time. It's better to hang it or store it in a large, breathable storage sack, such as a pillowcase. If you want to clean your sleeping bag before storing it, make sure you read the manufacturer's instructions. Before storing your tent, make sure it's dry and free from any dirt or debris. Store the tent loosely so it can breathe in a well-lit and ventilated area. If you're going to store your tent in a waterproof bag, make sure it's dry. Storing it damp can give it a permanent odor from mold and mildew. When putting away camp stoves, make sure they are empty of fuel. Store both the stove and the fuel containers away from open flame or heat, such as a furnace. It's always good to check the stove over thoroughly before putting it away. And always remember to test it out before you leave on your next trip. Now is also the time to fix any equipment that may be broken so you don't forget before your next trip. And check carefully for what you did not use. There's no use carrying what you don't use. That's about it for backpacking made easy. Remember, plan carefully and take your time. Backpacking should be fun, not an endurance test. A backpacking trip offers unique opportunities for renewal of spirit and body. Day hikes, nature study and photography, a retreat from civilization, and inspiring scenic vistas are all part of this. As you backpack, you'll become more fit and self-reliant. The sense of confidence and pride you feel after your first trip will be with you always. We hope this video will help prepare you for that first trip and the many others we know will follow. If you want to know more about getting the most out of being in the wild, you may want to check out Finding Your Way in the Wild, How to Enjoy Camping from Your Very First Trip, and Introduction to Canoeing.